brains loaded into a computer bank battling one another for power. It's like some science fiction movie. See, before man can turn, return to any form of sanity, he's got to come out of his trance and break free of this mind conditioning in the religious and the secular world and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. And that's going to only happen when he makes a concerted effort to do so through repentance and faith, proven by deeds. Then to diligently dig through the layers and layers and layers of deception and the lies and distortions and peel this away, the scales that have been clouding these things and obscuring that, the light of God's truth from his eyes for so long. It's simplistic, but extremely strenuous. And I think that's the reason Jesus said, strive to the point of agony. Of course, that word strive in the scriptures in Luke 13, 24, when he told them, what, how, well, there are few that will be saved, and then he told them to do that, that you're going to have to make every effort to the point of agony to enter through that narrow gate. This is the reason. Because of the lies and deceptions of men that want rather to worship this false image of Christ rather than Christ, whatever it's represented by. It's like Jesus said is the condemnation in John 3, 19 through 21. He says, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone doing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. But he that does the truth. See, you have to, first of all, to even believe what that says, have the ability to do the truth. See, he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen they have been done in God. That's the person that, like Luke 8, 8, 15 he talks about the seed fallen on the good and honest heart that's willing to take root, dig deep, break up the fallow ground, and come clean with God by his own choice. Because his deeds, he comes to the light. You see the difference here? The ability to perform deeds is the ability of unhindered free will. But when you're preaching it in the manner of this moral depravity in this inbred nature and all this other stuff they call it, then this doesn't make any sense that a person can even perform any deeds because that would be works. We've been through that a hundred times before. But see, the faithfulness is works, deeds performed, as he says of Abraham in James 2.24. You see, a man is saved by what he does and not by faith alone. You're not pronounced righteous in your sins. See, the professing Christian church worships the beast as the image of Christ. And they've evangelized the entire world with that message of inability and moral depravity and substitution and then all the necessary doctrines that validate the farce, that argue and argue and write books and reams and quote pundits of the past and all that stuff. See, the venom of this message has spilled over into every realm of society that exists and infected the human mind with an addiction that enslaves his ability to reason. That's what's happened. That's why everybody thinks, well, I'm born this way. I'm born an alcoholic. I'm born in uh, sexual perversion. I'm born into drug addiction. See, they've lost their ability to choose because they bought this lie. It's a powerful thing, the mind over matter thing. See, without a spiritual discernment, you're ensnared in this vicious cycle of repeated failure that it's inevitably going to lead to your final ruin, unless you break out of it. And you have nobody to blame but yourself, because every step along the wide road to destruction is taken by an individual choice that you made to self-seeking decisions that are contrived in your own mind to seek after your own personal desires and cravings. It's like James says, you covet and you cannot attain, and you fight and you war within yourself and you can never have what you ultimately want, because you want more and more, just like any billionaire on earth. He wants everything on earth. So what happens then with the dragon? See, the dragon plays you like a pawn, pulling the strings, always keeping that proverbial carrot 
dangling just beyond your reach. So you'll go for more. It's a deception that's brilliantly engineered over eons of history. And it successfully cloaked God's simple message of obedience to his way of peace and righteousness and substituted it with this putrid and rotting stench of death, depriving man of his common birthright and unhindered ability to obey God. That's what it's done. That's what this is all about. The mark of the beast, the whole thing is about this spiritual battle that you've been thrust into, even unclueless and unknowing. You're in this battle. Looking at, looking at it in a, in a carnal manner as some kind of movie. Not as trapping and enslaving your mind and your soul. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 16 says this. It says, Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in a triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. We are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, we are the aroma of death leading to death, but to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. Now, of course, the pastors and the church leaders have no clue what the Scripture means because their mind is carnal and they're living in their, and they're living in their wisdom of their own mind. See, because you can't understand righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come in the personal responsibility to turn from your self-interest and obey God in the simple understanding of repentance proven by deeds. See, what, is, is, what this is saying is that the genuine message of Christ is the aroma of death to this beastly image that's being portrayed to the world as churchianity or Christianity. That's what it means. See, it's the aroma of life to life to those that are coming out and being saved. That are finding true release through escape from the corruption that's in the world, through lust, through repentance. But to those in the church, we're the aroma of death to that beastly image. And that's why we're not welcome. See, they can't abide in the light of his truth because their deeds are evil. They won't come to the light, least what? They be exposed. When we expose their deeds, what do they do? They call us judges. They call us evil. They call us Beelzebubs. Hypocrites and all the rest of it. Always tell us, eventually, that we're all going to hell. See, if their deeds were done in God, in the, in the system today, they would be the ones standing in this dark day in, as the moral restraint against all the forces of evil that's enslaving everybody in the, in the, the depths of Satan. But they love not the truth, and they take pleasure in unrighteousness in the wretched man, filthy rags religion. So God's given them over to their strong delusion and withdrawn his restraints and cast them to the wind, like Second Thessalonians talks about, for chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. You think the Holy Spirit's going to be taken out of the way when you get raptured. Well, see, the church doesn't possess or represent the Holy Spirit because if it did, it'd be preaching against sin, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, telling people the righteousness, judgment, and self-control. See, the people in the system, they love their wretched man religion and the lying words of their pundits that promise them liberty as royal sons in rags. They sold themselves for nothing, as Isaiah said, and it's their choice then to wallow in their reprobate minds. In the reversal of nature, they've corrupted everything decent and true and hardened their own impenitent hearts in the face of God, like Romans 2.4 talks about, his patience and long sufferings to give them an opportunity to repent, and they shake their fist at him. See, they sought a paradise on earth, but they reap only shame and destruction. The way that seemed right to them was their path to catastrophe. Just like Proverbs says in chapter 1. He says, I behold, because I have called you and you refused, and I've stretched out my hand. See, it's stretched out all day long to you people. But you do not regard it. 
because you disdained my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. I will also laugh at your calamity, and I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm, and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, and I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, and they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge, and they did not choose the fear of the Lord, they wouldn't depart from their sins. They would have none of my counsel, and despised my every rebuke. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own doings, and be filled to the full with their own fancies, their fantasies. So in the simple way of truth, they know nothing about. For the time of turning away of the simple is going to slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me, whoever heeds the warning, whoever turns from their sins, will dwell safely and be secure without fear of evil. That's really the choice, the simple choice that people have to make. But they're told 24 hours a day by tens of thousands and millions of Bible pundits that they're not capable of obeying God. He obeyed for you. He's your substitution. We can, if we live in sin, it's only because that's because of what we are, is just helpless sinners and all the rest of it. Well, again, that's into the mouth of the dragon is where the system has taken you. And your only chance is to come out or share in her plagues and be destroyed. It's your choice to make.